So I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Life Scientific Lunch and Learn webinar series. Glad you guys could join us for this presentation of how to specify a pharmaceutical grade labeling system. This webinar is brought to you by Life Scientific Inc. and Newman Labeling. Let me do a bit of housekeeping before we jump into the presentation. Um, this is Marco, by the way. Uh, this is Marco, I'm part of the manager, <laughs> part of the LSI team. And uh, if you anyone had attended such a webinar before the pandemic, they'll be all uh, unfamiliar with the system that we're using. But we decided to use Zoom because everybody's using Zoom these days for everything, and all of the business meetings currently happening through Zoom. So if anyone has a question, you can hit up the chat option that's visible on this button uh, showcased in this uh, slide here. You can type the question in there or your comment in there. It will only send it to me as a host of this meeting and I'll read it out at the very end. Well, where Merbet, Mike and Martin, our speakers for today will be taking questions and answering those. Uh, please type those as you feel uh, needed. Don't wait till the end because you would, you would most likely require some time to type it in and then hit submit for, for that question. Uh, the Zoom chat might appear as a pop-up window or on the side, depending on your device preferences, but I'm sure you can, you can navigate through it. Okay. Okay, so, um, oh, go back one. There we go. Um, so, nope, go back one. <laughs> You're going too fast for me. I can't read that fast. Uh, so as uh, you were <laughs> heard earlier, my name is Mary Beth Iyer. I'm a pharmaceutical project manager for Life Scientific. Life Scientific is a manufacturer rep. Um, this not this slide, the slide that we were trying to get viewed before. I don't know why it's not coming up. It doesn't want to stay there. But that slide highlights the companies that we represent. If Which are also is, at the bottom of this slide. There we go. It's just, yeah, it's not like in this slide <laughs> I, for some reason. It's not wanting to stay auto there. Auto advancing there it is. or something. Read it, read it really fast before it disappears again. But this slide, um, it just uh, highlights the companies that we represent. So if your facility has any other needs, such as clean room equipment, you know, fillers, autoclaves, bottle cap torque testers, environmental cold rooms, um, just to name a few, just reach out to us after this presentation. Now this slide, nope, Marco's going, there we go. This slide is the production through chart. This um, uh, chart was created by my boss, Mike Bellum. It is an awesome tool that you can use to, um, like if you if you know some of your factors, say you know your containers per minute, then you can figure out your hourly rate, your monthly rate, your yearly output. Um, you know, once you know one of those factors or vice versa, you can you can back it up. There's also a handy little conversion chart there as well. So um, you can, you know, use that to figure if you, you know, when we go later into the URS, if you don't know, you know, how much you're going to be needing, that'll help us as well as help you when we're determining what unit you need. Now I'll turn it over to Mike Bellum. Oh, actually, ah, I do have and a it looks... single slide to cover before we start. Uh, this webinar, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel as all of the other webinars that we have done in the past are available at. So you're more than welcome to check out our YouTube page is at YouTube slash Life Scientific Inc. Uh, it will be, if you want us, we can send you a link to our YouTube channel after this uh, webinar is ended and we'll have a recording of this session as well as all of the other webinars we've done in the past available there. Cool. With that, okay. I'll now take it over to Mike. Well, thanks, Mary Beth. Thanks, Marco. Yeah, we have represented Newman in the Midwest since 1996. And um, last year, due to some unfortunate circumstances in the US, the passing of uh, our manager, Mike Cimarraro, uh, a few months after that, we uh, became responsible for North America. And in doing so, 
we've taken on responsibility for generating the initial quotations, providing uh, field service support, and in some cases, validation, execution, and related services. So um, our role has expanded as has our knowledge of the equipment. And one of the things that I had done early on in preparing to generate our own quotations for the Newman labeling system was to develop what we use internally, uh, pre-quote surveys for many of the different manufacturers in order to accumulate the information that's required to uh, have a manufacturer generate a quote. Now that we're doing it ourselves, we're asking a lot more questions and have uh, put together this spreadsheet that helps us generate a quote. And so that spreadsheet can also, as I had thought, well, it can certainly help a client generate a specification. So I figured we'd go through the spreadsheet, the function of it, the different line items. I'm not going to cover everything that's included in it, but um, one of the things that we can do and will do, um, two things, I think. Marco had asked for all the questions that may come up during the presentation that Martin, uh, the general manager from Newman, who's on with us, and Mary Beth and I We'll field the questions at the end of the presentation, but also we're going to take these comments into consideration and go through a final round of edits for this pre-quote survey form and circulate it so that you have it in-house to help you build a user requirement or uh, a quotation request. So we're happy to have the opportunity to maybe share one of our tools and that production throughput chart, you're going to see again what Mary Beth was discussing relative to the numbers, because what I did through the spreadsheet was add a bunch of comments for each or most of the line items rather. And so when you get a copy of the spreadsheet and you'll see a little red triangle in one of the cells, you click on that and it'll provide additional information about each one of those particular line items. So one of the first things that you want to take into consideration, who pushed my slide forward? I wasn't ready to move forward yet. Thank you so much. <laughs> Marco, I guess you're still in control. I'll let you, if you want to take care of that, that's fine. Um, I'm testing whether, yeah, it looks like you might need to advance the slide. So, um, or I have that now. I do, thank you. Okay, sorry. Anyway, when you start creating a specification, what is the purpose of that specification? Um, that I think is one of the first things you wanna answer. And uh, are you just looking for a budget number? Uh, if so, the level of specification can be minimal. It can be a three or four minute conversation with the vendor uh, about what your basic requirements are, what the major uh, functionality of the equipment may be, what things do you have upstream or downstream that need to be uh, taken into consideration. And you can be done with it. You can get a budget number from us very quickly. So if somebody is looking for a budget, you can send a short email with a brief description. We can have a, a quick call and generate a quotation from that. And on that quotation, there's gonna be a lot of the specifications that as the project may build and gain um, more interest or get approval, then we can go into much more detail in completing this 
pre-quote survey form and also help you develop a user requirement specification. So really the first thing you wanna do is consider how much work is it worth at this point in time? Is it really necessary to go into uh, dotting all the I's and crossing the T's? Or are you just looking for a number for preliminary approval? You don't need to um, overwork everybody that gets involved. It can be a lot of detail on the vendor side as well. So as I was mentioning before, um, we have these red throughout the spreadsheet that we'll uh, eventually wind up sharing. We have these red comment buttons and here's an example of the first line item. Newman basic machine application matrix. And this gives you an idea of, okay, well, just how simple it can be to narrow down a particular type of machine. And this matrix that uh, Newman generated makes that very handy. Okay, well, what type of container are you running? Ampules, bottles, syringes, how fast do you wanna run them? Okay, well, very quickly, you've narrowed down a machine or two that could be of particular interest just looking at the product selector and getting your job into a, a basic price range. Then from there, uh, there are a lot more line items on this that can provide quite a bit of additional detail. And for those of you that aren't maybe involved in labeling on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you may not realize that a labeling machine is a whole lot more than just uh, applying a sticker to a bottle. They are quite complex. There are a lot of um, sensors, a lot of machine functionality, um, quite a few points. In fact, Martin, how many points are on a PLC? So how many different um, different PLC <clears throat> controls do we have that's going in? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, well, it really depends on the complexity of the machine. You can um, have some uh, maybe 20 IO up to 40, 50, 60, 70 IO, depending on, on everything that's on the machine. Uh, once you yeah. get into higher levels of security, then a lot more there's a lot more involved. So this is a layout of one of our basic machines. Uh, it's the S150, and just gives you an idea of the number of different components that can go into even our base model. This particular unit is our most popular as well. And the primary reason for that machine being very popular is because it's real easy and quick to change over. It's a good machine for doing shorter runs. And a lot of our clients are not necessarily running the same product 24 seven. They're changing from one product to another. And that machine will get you speeds in the 150, 200 part per minute range, which is dependent on overall the vial uh, size, what you're running and a number of different criteria. We have machines that are significantly more sophisticated than that that run a lot faster. Uh, most of them are able to be put together similarly, but the difference comes in what they run and how fast they can run it. So this is snips of the whole pre-quote survey that we have developed. So 66 line items on the spreadsheet. And I am 
I seem to have occasionally lose control of the screens, but uh, one of the things that you should bring forward is, is this a new or existing product? It makes a difference because with an existing product, things have largely already been defined. And your job is a lot easier in developing a specification for perhaps expanded capacity around an existing product. And if it's a new product, there are a lot of things that can make the project more complex because there are quite a few more unknowns. We may not have the label, we may not have the uh, actual bottle dimensions. We can still do a reasonable job getting you close for a budget number, but there are things that are gonna have to be pulled together by the time it becomes a real project for any manufacturer to have a successful go at building the machine. Um, you know, sometimes we're dealing with projects where marketing hasn't defined the criteria for the label yet, then that seems to be kind of a uh, frequent, unfortunately, situation for new product. So is there a URS that's in existence or are you gonna build one? The pre-quote survey can be incorporated as um, or a preface to a good URS because it'll help you identify a lot of the criteria for the machine, the options, and works well to use as part of a template for generating the pre-quote survey. The pre-quotes that we go through we're often doing them several times. So we'll go through the questionnaire and there'll be a lot of holes in it, but the, the client's got to go through and figure out the general information that is still yet to be determined. However, that gets us from a five minute phone call to a lot more detailed and more accurate budgetary quotation that we can wind up generating. And the next iteration will be even a more fine-tuned quotation and a more developed specification. Often our clients are gonna take the information from a pre-quote and put that as part of their overall validation manual, as well as the quotation. I don't know how many of you are putting the vendor quotes as part of the validation manual, but it is not a bad idea to incorporate that for full documentation from the very onset of the project. So if you are gonna generate a URS, and we've had projects that have run a number of different ways, just from verbal communication through development of our pre-quote survey through the generation of a complete URS. Sometimes our projects start with a URS that we then help the client detail out, but this is an example. If you need to build a URS for your internal requirements, we have multiple templates that are available based on the particular parameter of the machine that you might be looking for. This is a good example of a templated URS that we can share and are happy to do so. So we're identifying or helping you write the URS. We've got a, a purpose, scope, responsibility, process and equipment description, all of which 
serves for you to go in, review the document and add whatever criteria you see appropriate. One of the things that should be well defined here is not only the equipment description, but the process so that we as the manufacturer have a really good understanding of how this equipment is going to be used and getting the operators involved in the process description can be very helpful. So the equipment description is certainly quite important. And that's one of the things that our pre-quote survey will help generate is a detailed equipment description. Um, but having the operator information is really good. Here in the technical requirements, we've got you know, general requirements, mechanical requirements, control, hardware requirements. And, you know, one of the areas that um, would be good to consider is how tight do you need to specify the different items that are going into a machine? So, do you have to get down to a particular sensor vendor or can you leave it a little more open when you're developing the specification? That's important because if you get down to the component level and, oh, we have to have this type of UV sensor or, sorry, luminescence sensor going onto the machine, the vendor that you're working with may have no experience with that particular sensor type, making it more challenging for them to manufacture successfully, um, more difficult to incorporate this component versus what they're used to working with. Um, we, as Mary Beth had said earlier, we represent a number of manufacturers and one of the things that we found with Newman is, I guess really due to their experience, 70 years manufacturing, over 70 years manufacturing pharmaceutical labeling machines, they've become very open to a lot of different sensor types, but you have to be careful. Try not to over-specify unless it's absolutely mandatory. Yeah, well, one of the things there, uh, Mike, if I can interrupt briefly, is <clears throat> because of all the experience that Newman have, we we just use uh, industry recognised sensors. So, although uh, a client may have a particular preference for one, the sensors that we use will be comparable with that. They'll be sort of the same level specification. Right, and. The same applies for software requirements. It gets a lot more difficult if somebody's trying to dictate the type of software or control system that may be used as the HMI on a particular machine type. That may be something, in fact, that vendors wind up walking away from. But, you know, there are two primary HMIs that we as a manufacturer work with, and uh, typically it's going to be Allen Bradley or Siemens style control system. The 6.5 layout and installation requirements, that is very good information to have. And here you want to be highly detailed, providing drawings and uh, where the equipment's going to be placed as is possible to help us look at the overall footprint of a machine and determine whether or not it's going to fit, how it's going to fit. Do we need to make any particular modifications to the uh, in feed or out feed of the system? Um, Part of your requirement may be specification of some of the terms and conditions of the warranty, what level of training is gonna be required and 
one of the areas that Martin's going to cover in quite a bit more detail are the documentation options that we have available because uh, most of um, your vendors dealing in pharmaceutical are going to have some different level of documentation that they can supply. Newman has a number of different options that um, you may or may not need. So getting down to the pre-quote survey, one of the first things that we're gonna be looking at is how to start with your information and help plug that into our project. So do you have a container ID? Um, if you don't have nomenclature for identifying the particular containers, then we can supply that for you. But if you do have a current ID system, then we're happy to get that into the early specification or early quotation process so that uh, it follows through your validation documentation. If you're going to be looking for a labeling machine, one of the things you'd like to try to be able to provide are the drawings. Um, are those available? If not, we're gonna need um, to know the size, the diameter, the height, but certainly drawings are very helpful. Sometimes a drawing might not suffice and in order to quote a job, we may have to get samples. That gets really challenging in situations where <laughs> the samples might not, be in existence as of yet, but we'll do our best to quote off of the information that you can provide to us. Yeah, it's you, you can't beat having physical samples in your hand to to uh, assess how well it's going to run on the machine. Having said that, we appreciate that if it's uh, if it's a new project, then samples would necessarily be available, and also some people just doing secondary packaging where they only have live products and obviously uh, they can't release that. So we do often quote from drawings if necessary. So something to think about, take into consideration are, well, of course, the container, but what's the machine capable of running? So our typical machines will handle containers that <coughs> are from 10 to 150 millimeters in diameter, uh, label height from 10 to 150 millimeters. Um, that gets restricted with a particular option, the FLR, which I think Martin is something you're gonna cover in a little more detail later on. Yeah. Um, but there are, any labeling machine is going to have physical limitations on what it is capable of running. And that's why a vendor winds up with a number of different machines to accommodate a number of different requirements. But as a general rule of thumb, taking some of these considerations into your specification and knowing the limitations of different vendors and how big a label or what type of label can possibly be run is good in the development of the specification. Here's a number, how high off of the container does the label have to be placed? And with Newman, we need two millimeters off the uh, conveyor in order to place a label. What's the diameter of a label reel? Uh, every manufacturer is gonna have a maximum diameter. We have different machines that can handle smaller or larger label reels. And why is a label reel size important? Well, one of the principal reasons is uh, bigger reels don't have to get changed nearly as frequently. And that may or may not be um, a factor, 
depending on how much you're running the equipment and what options you may have in order to avoid the downtime for a label reel change out. Some of the line items on this pre-quote survey are not specifically um, relative to how we would go about quoting. They're more just information and things that perhaps you should think about in the overall scope of your project, but don't really impact the labeling machine that much. Um, however, some of these items, like if the product is tubular or molded, can make a difference. Uh, tube product is a little lighter. It perhaps is a little less stable. Molded is a little heavier and more stable, sometimes easier to run, a little more durable. The product, of course, is it glass or plastic? And there are differences. If we're running plastic, sometimes there's handling issues with plastic, but plastic is certainly a lot more user friendly, it generates less noise, it's easier to handle, it can be bulk packed, but product stability can very much be uh, a factor. The container, is it clear or amber? You might not think this makes a significant difference, um, but when you're trying to look through an amber vial and determine whether or not there's a luminescence coating on a label, checking for label presence, uh, that amber color can have some impact and may determine whether or not we need front and back sensors to show the amount of luminescence on a particular product. Total fill volume on the vial makes a difference. If it's uh, the percentage of vial is filled quite a bit more, then the product may be a little less stable than if it only has uh, weight down at the bottom of the vial. So, of course, when we're talking about a machine, one of the first things that's going to be coming up is what's the run speed. So I think on a subsequent slide, I show the production throughput chart again. But if you have 60 containers per minute that you need to run, what does that translate to in throughput per day or throughput per year? And that's the reason we developed this production throughput chart. So it's one of the, you know, in one of the comments and, you know, if you're running 22 hours a day at 10 parts per minute, here's your production number. If you take that 10 parts per minute to uh, say six hour days, which is typical production time, an hour for uh, startup, an hour for close down. So that's running at 250 days, 300 days, six hours a day, or 300 days, 18 hours a day. That's what the production throughput chart is looking at for you. Another factor, we're labeling bottles, we're not typically labeling caps, but a uh, Im really important consideration is that cap. And if it's a new product, and we just dealt with the situation where the cap was bigger than the bottle. And it's not uncommon, but it really is not recommended. And we did a startup of a machine and there were issues upstream and issues on our machine. When product starts ganging up, it can topple and become unstable because the cap is bigger than the body of the bottle. 
So really do try to avoid having a product like that. It is a handling issue on the labeling machine and all others. But the good news is, is if we know about it on the front end, we can develop different handling systems other than a typical conveyor to move that bottle through. There are a number of different considerations for the type of label that you're going to be applying. You've got extended content labels, different types of IDs that might be pre-printed on a label or that may need to be printed. Of course, serialization requirements come into play and we have machines that can serialize the labels or work with pre-printed serialized labels. Also, if there's some type of RFID embedded in the label, all of that is going to make a difference as to how the machine overall is going to get designed and built. Some things you want to look at are maybe the adhesive type, the material, is it clear or opaque? I think clear labels have their share of challenges associated with handling. So you want to think carefully about what you're trying to work with, especially if it's a new product, what are you going to be working with? and what's easier to run on the particular machine. Um, we had a job recently where the label that was gonna be run wasn't appropriate for the application. And it was a biological that had minus 80 storage and the type of ribbon going into the printer was not correct because it couldn't handle cryo storage temperatures. So every little aspect, every detail of um, how the product's gonna be operated and run is important. The, I had mentioned earlier, some of the limitations of the machine might be the label core. So it's possible with our units, uh, typically we're looking at a three inch core, but sometimes odd size label cores can be difficult to handle. Which way is the label going to be unwound? How do you have it printed? There are a number of different types of wind directions that are available and uh, row 34 on our US URS shows some of these different types of cores that you can get and the wind direction that you have available for you. Okay, do you want me to pick up for a while, Mike? Um, yeah, if you want to talk about the printer, you're fine. Yeah, um, well, obviously, if you're um, you're running products, uh, you need to look at printing variable data on the label, uh, batch number, use by date, uh, manufacturing date, that sort of thing. Uh, Newman you know, can offer a, a choice of printers. There are different types of printers out there. Um, over the years, we've worked with all the major printer manufacturers and we can either offer our, our own preferred default models or, or we can fit a customer specified printer. Um, but yeah. really the, the, the type of printer is um, so it's determined by several factors. Uh, the, the image we have there is a, a hot foil printer. Um, and, and each type of printer has its own uh, pros and cons. So it really down to, to what your application is. Um, for example, the hot foil printer, it's uh, initially a cheaper unit than uh, some other options. Uh, it's good for high speed printing. 
Um, it's quite simple operation, simple construction, and it's easier to match the uh, the print ribbon to the label material, which is something Mike mentioned earlier about if you have special label materials. Um, on the downside, it is uh, it's less versatile. Um, the printing is done by individual characters put into a type set, heated up to 130 or 100 degrees C, and then stamped into the label. So other options for instead of the, the hot bowl or the hot stamp, uh, the next option really is, is thermal transfer. So you could have a thermal transfer printer. Again, we work with uh, most of the major manufacturers. Um, the, one of the main advantages of thermal transfer is the fact that they're, they're so versatile. Um, you can print numerous lines of text um, in different font styles. Uh, you can print uh, barcodes, 2D codes, or data matrix type codes, even bitmap images. Uh, they just load it into the HMI for the printer, download it, and it will print. Um, and because of the way they're, they're loaded, you can uh, connect them up to a, a vision system. So the, the data can be entered into the vision system. The vision system will send it to the printer, tell the printer what to print. And then uh, as the cycle carries on, the vision system will then check that print to make sure it's correct. Good. Uh, and, yeah. and they're also they're, they're, you know, very suitable for serialization. So you can have sequential numbering, things like that. With, with that Something Obviously, impossible uh, on a hot stamp. Yeah, because uh, on a hot stamp, you've got individual characters that you, you have to place in metal characters. You, you haven't got that option for, serial, uh, for the um, uh, incrementing numbers and serialization. But and thermal that, transfers the, made a lot of advances and even can be capable of printing the entire content of the label. Yeah, that, that's very popular with um, uh, you know, bio um, uh, research places where they'll, they'll keep plain white label stock and they will print the entire label depending on, on what the product is that they're running through. They're doing an R&D project, they can print and we've had some customers that do uh, um, low volume personalized product. So they were print a, a batch of labels for one particular patient with the patient's name and all the dosage and then different program into the thermal transfer printer and then they can print the late batch of labels for the next patient. So they really are very versatile. Um, that versatility does come at a cost. They're, they're more expensive than a hot foil printer. And also depending on what you're printing, they can be slower. So if you can appreciate the more data you're going to print, the more time it takes to print. So uh, if you're looking to run a machine at 500 a minute, then you really need to be looking at a hot foil. Um, Moving on from the thermal transfer, if you're going up the stage, you have um, we can offer uh, scribing laser printers, which again are very versatile. They're also very high speed, but that comes up as uh, a lot more expensive, something like three times the price of a thermal transfer printer. Um, again, we're looking at uh, the specifics of the label because if you want to use a laser scribing laser then we're into putting a, a dark area on the label to print onto so that that can be burnt away and leave the text. Um, also with a laser, because you are burning, um, it causes fumes. So it's necessary to have an extractor and various other safety features to protect against the laser. So that's the... Uh, so options with printers. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, I've got the con uh, slide control. Yeah, there mm -hmm. we go. So there are um, 
like we were discussing earlier, do you require any level of buffer on the in feed or the out feed? There are a number of different options that can go into the machine to help accommodate your throughput. And these are a few examples of some of the different buffer handling tables that we have manufactured. But um, that's a consideration of the equipment that is going to be upstream or downstream as uh, the labeling in line with perhaps the upstream inspection machine or liquid filler, or are you manually transporting and scraping off? Uh, if you are manually transporting and scraping off, then one of these rotary tables would be good for that, or they can be used like in the example here, they can be used as a buffer for the in feed or out feed. And like Mike was saying earlier in these options, these are things that don't necessarily determine the actual type of labeler that you're going to use or need. Um, but this is an option that you need to consider because if it's your overall budget and this is something you need, then we can put it on the quote ahead of time, knowing that you're going to need it, which will then help you in your overall budget. The, the other thing we can do as well then is, is pro provide a layout drawing with these extra items on the drawing. So if you need to work out where in your packing hall um, you're going to put the equipment or what you can, what space you have, because you know, nine times out of 10 space is a premium on a packing hall. Um, so we can help with uh, layout drawings in a PDF or a DWG format, so you can can drop it into your own project plan and see how it pans out for you. Okay. Okay. Um, Mike mentioned earlier about the uh, FLR or faulty label. Uh, removal system. Um, obviously, a, a fundamental requirement of a labeling system is to ensure that you only get accepted, inspected products coming out of the machine. And Newman, for years or many years ago, we developed a secure system um, that would ensure that there was no unlabeled products or no product with 40 printed labels. Um, coming out of the machine. They, they were rejected into the reject station and uh, the reject was verified. And that's still a, a fundamental, fundamental part of our, our machine, our machine security system. So uh, it's an option on a basic labeler. We can offer the reject station, which will pick up an unlabeled product or, or a badly printed product. But moving a step forward from that and after further development, um, we now have the uh, patented Newman Faulty Label Removal System, or FLR, as we've abbreviated it to. And the way this will work is the, the labels on the back of the web are detected by uh, an inspection system, um, which can be one of several methods. We'll get to that in a little while. But the, um, the results of that uh, inspection are fed into the machine. The, the machine tracks that, that label. Um, if it's a good label, then that's absolutely fine. But if it's uh, a faulty label, then it's as it passes through the faulty label removal of the FLR, that label is uh, removed from the backing web and therefore taken off the web prior to the labeling station. Uh, what this does for you is it eliminates the need to spend resources removing labels from live products. And it also reduces uh, product scrap rate because you're not applying bad labels to good products. And uh, a unique feature on the, the FLR, is I know there are other systems available. Um, each rejected label is collected in sequence onto a roll of paper, like a cash register roll. Um, and this allows for simple, easy reconciliation at the end of a batch. So that the position of the faulty labels are in sequence as they happened. So it'd be very easy to match that with the history of a uh, vision system. So you can check back through 
the first label that we rejected was this one, and you can see where the errors lie on the print. Um, and as each label is removed, the uh, the FLR checks one to check to ensure that it's been collected onto the paper roll, and two to ensure that it's no longer on the vacuum web. So you've got that double verification to prove that the uh, the faulty label has been removed. Uh, another advantage with the FLR over some of our competitors is that this will reject labels and collect the labels at full production speed. Uh, so there's no need to for the machine to slow down to allow the, the, uh, the reject to be collected. You can be running the machine at 250, 300 a minute. The bad ones are just, just uh, diverted off and collected and the machine carries on running at production speed. Uh, also on this slide, we've got uh, the Easy Splice 470, which is um, something Mike had mentioned as well. So we talked about the uh, the label rule size, you know, on uh, some of the standard machines would be 300 mil, and some of the other machines would be uh, 480 mil or 450 mil. Um, but if you're running a high speed application or you're using long labels, um you can even with a large label or size you're into frequent time consuming label rule changes uh, so what we can do with the the easy splice um it accommodates two 18 inch diameter label rules one is the the current label supplier so that's the one being used by the label at the time the second one can be prepped ready for uh, a rapid splice as the first one is completed and the way we deal with that is uh, there's a, a reservoir of labels on the machine, which acts as a buffer for the labeler. Um, at the diameter of the label rules is, is constantly monitored. And as the, the uh, current label rule comes down to a minimum diameter, which is adjustable, it will sound an alert for the operator, which would be a, a beacon and an alarm, attracts the operator to the machine, um, they initiate the splice process and um, while that is going on the, the uh, labeler is using labels that are in the reservoir um, and then as soon as the operator completes the splice uh, the machine just, just continues running and although it is a, it's a standalone machine and it, and it is an option um, it is connected to the labeler, so it does have communications. So in the event that something was to go wrong, the operator didn't do the splice quick enough or, or whatever, the East splice will communicate with the labeler and it will um, uh, put the labeler into a controlled shutdown so there's no, no sticky messes. So. Um, and so we, we had mentioned earlier about um, vision systems and, and print detection. Uh, an important part of the machine, if you're printing your, your variable data on the, on the label, you, you need to make sure that it's there. So we can offer print verification in, in several different forms. Um, this can even be done by a, a contrast sensor, which is the photo on the left-hand side of the slide. And this is basically looking for black print on the white background. So it'll be set on, on one or of the lines of print. And if that line is missing, good possibility there's no print there at all. And that'll capture that. Uh, a little bit up from that is a, a smart sensor, which is looking for um a pattern match of the print or pi pixel count so it's it's taught what the image should look like and it, it's checking to make sure um that image is there the advantage that has over the contrast sensor is you might only have some of the line missing and it will pick up on that working in percentage and then moving up from that um would be a full uh, optical character verification system or OCV. So camera system um, trained for each individual character 
it knows what it's looking for, it's been told that it's printing XYZ, so it's checking to see that XYZ is there. Each character is scored. If there's a partial character or a character missing, then that would be classed as a reject. But whichever um, method is used, and we successfully, over many years, we successfully integrated numerous OCV manufacturers. We can fully integrate Optel, Lotus, Kiehl's, Metal Toledo, Jackson, Systec, uh, Lixis, Cognex, and, yeah, and many others. But, um, whichever system is selected, whether it is the, the uh, contrast sensor or full-blown OCV, the way we deal with it is the same. So um, we work on a, a positive accept principle, basically meaning that if we don't get a good result, then it's automatically a bad result. So the sensor or the camera would be looking at the label when it comes along. It checks uh, if there's a good print, then that's all absolutely fine. The good result goes into is entered into the machine. If there's a bad result or no result, then that goes down as a, it's a missed result, so therefore it would be classed as a, as a reject. So the good results go into uh, a shift register on the machine, which is tracking each label as it goes through the machine. Um, so if you've got uh, if you've got a bad result, there'll be this missed result in the shift register, and each time a label is applied, that is incremented through the machine. Um, and then it either gets to the FLR device, in which case the machine checks the shift register to see if there's a good result, and if there's not, it will remove that label. Or if there's no FLR, it's applied to the vial, tracks through down to the reject station, and the same logic of the, uh, uh, applies. If there's a, a product on the conveyor and we don't have a good result for it, that's rejected as well. And the difference is really between the, the, all the different systems, it comes down to uh, requirements um, and budget. Mm. You want to pick up for a while, Mike? Okay. Um, <laughs> I mentioned. Yeah, I, I mentioned about um, uh, going down to the reject station. So, um, as, as a product is labelled on, on the labour, it passes the uh, leaves the labour station, gets to the reject station, and we're checking for several different things. Um, and one of those is obviously the fact that there's a label there. You know, the object of the label is to put a label there uh, on the vial. So we check that presence uh, usually with uh, a luminescence sensor, which is looking for uh, UV in the label. Um, so the basic logic again is the machine will see a product and it will check back to the UV sensor. Have you seen uh, or the luminescence sensor? Have you seen the label? Yes or no? It will check the shift register from the, uh, the print verifier. Have you seen a good print? Yes or no? And if either of those results are no, then uh, the product is rejected off the conveyor and into a reject bin. Um, and then once it enters the reject bin, there's a sensor checking across to make sure that each reject has entered the bin and it's not just sitting on the conveyor. Um, the the, the machines have various uh, various uh, checks on their watchdogs, sensors looking for things. Uh, we're checking for consecutive faults. We're checking for sensors failing high, sensors failing low. Um, and and all, all these conditions uh, are programmed to either set an alarm off or stop the machine, whatever. Um, so in the event that there is a fault, the, the machine would stop or sound an alarm or, or activate a beacon. So we can offer different, uh, different beacon arrangements, 
uh, we go with red green as stock for default, green is, is running in production mode, um, and then amber would be for low level of something, different labels or oil or, or anything like that. At the same time, if the machine goes into default condition, there'll be a, a banner comes up on the, the HMI to let you know why the machine has stopped. Um, might touch briefly on the PLCs. Uh, we offer uh, two main PLCs, which will either be a Siemens or an Adam, Adam Bradley. They're both industry recognized, both good for bus systems. Um, so you know, the choice is there. It's something that can be selected at point of uh, um, point of order or point of inquiry. Uh, within the operating systems on the machine, although you, you, there's a choice of different PLCs, uh, the features are, that are available are the same from one model to another. So we have um, the operating system has three levels of access to give security. Uh, there's the operator, which would be just just in the run mode. So if you're in uh, production mode, the operator can log on. Um, limited access to features on the machine. They can stop and start the machine, put correct faults um, or, or stoppages, view the run counters, uh, and view the conditions of the shift registers to, to track um, product with the machine. Uh, another feature in uh, the uh, S250, 350, and Valve 550 models is uh, in process control. So uh, a QA person can come along during the run uh, with the aid of a key, they can uh, switch to a particular mode, produce a, a fault, um, be it an overprint or a, a missing label, and then that fault will be tracked through the machine and rejected at the reset station. Uh, having done that, they switch back to the normal production mode. They've got a record that uh, 1203. They produced a, a, a fault, the fault was rejected, and it will be counted on the run counters as well. So that's all available with the HMI. Um, it gives access to the run counters and machine settings, and also the machines come with uh, a recipe provision. So a recipe can be loaded for each different uh, product being used. Um, and that will have all the soft settings automatically on it. So you load the recipe, the machine speed will change, the, uh, the shift register for tracking the, um, the faulty labels will change, um, and any other variable, soft variables. And at the same time, the recipe will also give you hard settings. So which position to put the sensor in, what change parts to, to use, if it's necessary to change them and all the other data. So the operator has that available to them when they need to do the size change. Uh, another option that we can offer that's uh, becoming more and more um, prominent is uh, 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. Um, something through uh, with the FDA where they like to um, check that um, a record is kept, an audited record is kept out of all the activities that have happened to the machine while it's been running a batch, production batch. So we can offer this on, again, both Siemens or the Allen Bradley. Um, so it can be set up to record uh, any event that happens on the machine during its production run including, for example, which operator is logged on, um, uh, any recording any stoppages if the machine is stopped for a uh, full run out or label run out. Or uh, if somebody was to go in and change any parameters, that would be recorded. And all this data is uh, recorded in the machine and logged um, and available to be printed out or to be exported to uh, uh, an external server or, or to send to an SD card. 
And the key thing about it to satisfy to anyone uh, CFR is this information can't be edited, it can't be changed. So it's fixed, so you've got that um, unique record of that production run. Okay, do you want to pick up Mike? Yeah, I think I'm unmuted yeah. now. Sorry. Okay. So I think I think people probably fed up with my voice for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Martin. So here are just a few more of the different options you may want to consider when specifying a machine, a final product throughput counter to identify everything that's coming out of the unit. Um, one of the things that Martin and I were discussing earlier is uh, Ethernet port and modem. And these often will get specified, but the frequency of them actually getting placed into practice is less. Uh, the validation issues with this information going through the network can create uh, problems and the modem being used as remote diagnostics can also have its level of validation related um, problems. So although it's an available option, the actual implementation of it isn't that frequent. So you want to consider yeah. some of these things, whether they really are things that are going to be put into practice or are just interesting concepts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have found, found that um, sometimes it'd be on the wish list, um, but if the, uh, the host server on the site isn't configured to match with the machine, then you often find that the firewall on the server won't allow the machine to communicate. Um, but it can be used for diagnostics, it can be used for data collection. Um, so it really depends on, on your requirements. The uh, low label sensor doesn't necessarily come as standard on all machines, but can be tied into uh, one of the beacon alert symbols. So the machine will start flashing an amber light to indicate to uh, perhaps operator that's working on a different part of the line at the time that you're getting ready to run out of labels and the machine needs attention. So that can help keep you in production more frequently. Um, I cannot advance the slide. Okay, I'll give it a go. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we talked about validation and, and um, yeah, the need for validation of the, the fact that we can offer document packages. Um, we've, you know, any business producing pharmaceuticals or associated products needs to validate their production process. Um, and the validation package needs to be designed to satisfy you know, all, the, all the necessary uh, regulations and guidelines. Newman have uh, been producing machines for the pharmaceutical industry for many years. The machines are designed primarily for the pharmaceutical industry and they're designed to be validation ready. Uh, we can offer a validation package to help the end user's uh, route to having a fully validated process. We can do that either as a, a, a partial validation package or a full validation package. So if I um, to go through what we offer in a full validation, and then I can uh, put that to the partial. So the validation is written around, uh, it, it's a risk-based approach that we have. So we're checking, uh, focuses on the quality critical aspects of the system. Uh, we know our machines, we know the processes that they're performing, so we're best placed to consider what needs to work precisely, how things should be detected, uh, and really, you know, what can go wrong. So 
um, the document documentation is written around checking every stage of that. So uh, a full package would be um, a full package would have document approvals. So each validation package is, is customized to suit the system that's being tested. Um, based around tried and, a tried and tested template that is prepared as a customized document and that's sent out to the customer for their approval. Uh, the next section is the uh, validation master plan, which is really an explanation of our interpretation of the current CGMP and validation guidelines for the pharmaceutical industry and how we present them within the validation package. Uh, machine control system testing is something that would be uh, carried out on the machine during its build and during its testing prior to FA2. So this would include um, uh, voltage checks on the I.O., um, checking presets, checking uh, HMI functions, just to make sure that everything that should be happening is, is happening. Uh, Section four, pre-delivery machine testing. Uh, this is uh, this includes full functionality testing of the labor and the control system. It includes all safety features, system access, security, product inspection security, um, counter verification, critical device checking, 21 CFR if it's selected, um, and uh, a series of performance runs. And, and this is, often used as a tool for factory acceptance testing and it, and it fits in with the uh, factory acceptance procedure. Following that is a final inspection che checklist. So this is uh, um, carried out prior to shipping, just to verify that um, everything is there, the machine is in good condition and any um, ancillary items have their serial numbers recorded on the type recorders so that it's a record of what was in that machine. So sections one to five are prior to dispatch. After dispatch of the machines received uh, on site, then um, uh, usually with a Newman technician, but some uh, clients choose to do this themselves, but we'll have the uh, installation and commissioning um, and that will be, uh, as we go through that, different aspects of the machine are inspected and checked. Some of it is similar to section three. Um, and from opening the crate, it takes us from opening the crate to preparing the machine for the operation qualification or OQ. So section seven, the OQ, uh, mainly a repeat of section four. But section four was it, uh, our premises, so factory acceptance testing, section seven, uh, site acceptance testing or SOT, and just checking that, that everything is still okay and nothing's moved during transportation. So that is the, the full um, validation, Newman standard validation package. We do offer uh, a Newman documentation package, which is um, document approval, installation qualification, and the operational qualification. So it really comes down to how much help the uh, end user wants with their validation process. The procedures in the, uh, the pre delivery and the OQ, there's method. Uh, reason for the test, the method of the test, acceptance criteria. So tests are documented, do A, B and C, and your results should be D, E, F, and it's just checking off each aspect. I'll just, I'll just hey. see if it's a Okay, I think we covered that one. Yep, content you've already covered. Great. Marco, I think we're getting close to time to wrap up here. Were there any questions that we needed to answer?
Yes, uh, there were a few of them. Let me just read those out to you. Uh, okay. Yes, Jesus will send you the uh, questions, uh, the a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. We had a question regarding the thermal transfer and how do we ensure that the ribbon is suitable for the label? Okay, good question. Um, what we would do is, you know, it's an important thing. So when we take an order for a machine with a thermal transfer printer, uh, we ask for sample labels. We, uh, we send the sample labels then to the printer manufacturer for print trials, and they find a suitable ribbon that's going to be uh, readable and permanent, so that it's not going to rub off. Um, and then if the machine, moving on from that, if the machine is also to be fitted with an OCV system, then once we've received the printed labels back from the uh, printer manufacturer, we send them on to the uh, OCV system manufacturer and they do an evaluation on it to ensure that the printed labels can be uh, inspected by the camera and that they're of an acceptable quality to give uh, a consistent good result. So it, that's coming back to, we mentioned before about having samples in your hand. I hope that answers that one. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Martin. And the second question that we have is regarding the faulty label removal tool. And the question is, uh, does the machine slow down the re uh, down the process when it tries to remove a label? And what the, this is a two part question. And the second part is, uh, what type of impact does uh, this have of the on the overall output of the machine? Okay. Uh, uh I think that's something I touched on, but the uh, the FLR doesn't need to slow the machine down. It would, it will remove labels at full production speed, so uh, there's no impact on the production output from the speed point of view. If the machine is running at 300 a minute and you have 40 label that labels removed, the machine carries on, continues to run at 300 a minute, um, and doesn't miss a beat. And we also had another one regarding the FLR, the faulty label removal. And the question is, is there a loss of product due to label removal or are the labels removed prior to being applied to the container? Okay, the, the labels are removed prior to being applied to the container. So they're removed from the, the backing web or the liner. Um, and put onto the uh, the paper roll on the FLR. This does give a space where the label would be. So um, as that space comes to the labeling station, there would be an unlabeled vial, but that is projected at the reject station and subject to SOP can be recycled. Okay. So, so there's no, no waste product. Okay, let me check for more questions. Um, I think those were it. Those were the questions that we've received till now. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much. If anything additional comes up, you know where to find us. We'll certainly be in contact with the revised pre-quote survey. If anybody is in development of a uh, specification or a URS and needs the template, please let our office know. We'll be happy to share that with you. And certainly uh -huh. if uh, there's interest in a particular machine, we're happy to um, provide you with a quotation. Don't hesitate to let us know. Appreciate the time. Hope you have found some of the content useful to your future work. Thanks everyone. Most Thanks appreciated. Thanks everyone for sticking yeah. through us to the end. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a great day. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.